Welcome to this, our 47th episode of Apex Instant Tips, coming to you live every Friday at 12.05 Eastern Time from the great state of Massachusetts, sorry, Maine this week. For five minutes only, my name is Hayden. And Hayden, I actually am in Massachusetts, but uh, I think we're, we're doing a pretty good job this, this week of covering the, the areas of New England. Uh, exactly right. So to, to balance out Maine and New England, we brought in someone from New Hampshire. Uh, welcome, Chris Rice. Hey guys, I'm actually from Maine originally, so I'll lean towards your side. Ah, I like um, it. Yeah, we we should have somehow met in the middle on this one. It's not that you know we're we're all within a pretty close close range. All New England, it's all in the family. Yeah. yeah. Next time. Um, well, as it turns out, um, this is, um, and we didn't know it when we started, but this is part three of a series. Uh, two weeks ago, we did J Meter talking about. Um, understanding your infrastructure and your performance capabilities. Then last week we talked a little bit more about um, protecting yourself from bad actors um, or, or bad, not just bad actors, but your own bad code. And then today we're gonna to talk about one of those aspects where your own bad code, you, you may have figured it out because resource manager kept kicking people out or, or possibly you're getting that dreaded 503 error um, that we, we talked about last week. And in particular, Chris, you're here because I know this is very near and dear to your heart. Right, so uh, I help manage the autonomous database, which includes Apex and ORDs and everything that's out there and have personally spent time with customers on this exact problem that we're gonna outline today. And they went from having issues to uh, flawless rollout worldwide. Well, with that uh, teaser, uh, shall I go ahead and share your screen, Anton? Yeah, share my screen. And I'm, uh, as people might notice, I'm not where I normally am. I'm. Uh, sitting at my wife's computer because mine is still so slow. I got to get those cheapskates at Instum to get me a new laptop. <laughs> <laughs> but I am waiting till Monday to see what uh, what Apple announces. Uh, so with that caveat, um, I'm on my wife's uh, machine and hopefully it will be fast. Let me, but speaking of fast, go ahead and kick off the timer if you haven't already. Um, what we've got here is the a, the in some fitness tracker, uh, we we have a little competitions, um, and this is just an example. But um, these are different offices. Right now, Boston is killing it with 296 total times. So we this little sample application has just two tables: the site and then the activities of the people that have sites. So if I go ahead and create a new activity here uh, for myself, say, and I it's a run, and I've done an extra 15 minutes, and click create. It happens really quickly and it automatically updates the site's uh, total to 311 and it's great. It all works super. But there are a lot of folks that don't want to have to go and, and log their activity in multiple places. So what we did is we added the ability to call out to Garmin or Strava or RunKeeper, these different areas and let them, uh, it automatically makes a web service call. I'll show that really quickly. So in addition to the, the just automatic row processing, we've added these web service calls that call out to Strava and RunKeeper and such. Um, the, the, real, the little bit of a challenge in this is that if I actually do create one, so I'm gonna have, go into this separate session and this is logged in as Nick. Nick's gonna do a ride, a uh, bike ride, uh, and he's gonna post it to Garmin and Strava. But you'll see this is pretty slow. But the problem is, while that's processing, even if I don't post, the, my session gets slow. What's going on here? Why is my session slow? Because he's posting to Garmin. Now, are they uh, trying to update the same record? Well, you know, initially I would say no, because it's just doing an insert. But if we take a look at it, this insert, this table actually has a trigger that does update the total time on the parent site record. So I guess the answer, I guess the answer really is yes, we're updating the same site record. Right. So, so. then with, with that looking very simple, the other thing we have to think about is where do the commits happen on these processes? Right, so. So by default, the commit happens at the very end of the request going to Apex. So after all of these processes run, then it commits. After all those processes. 
So when I'm doing both of these activities, the one locks the site record, the other has to wait on that lock. And in fact, the debug, um, I ran this in debug and that's exactly what I'm seeing. It's actually, the, this, this session isn't waiting on these, this session's waiting on the, the process form, whereas the, the session that's posting to Strava is waiting on, on the web service. How do we fix it? So the actual uh, transaction is really just your activity table and updating the parent record. So right. one of the things we can do is uh, put a commit right there versus waiting till the end of the entire process flow to do the commit. So I guess what I have to do is create a process, throw it up here, call it commit. And it's really all I'm doing in this process is hitting commit, right? Yeah. So we're, we're shortening the transaction scope to literally just what we're dealing with in the database and then leaving the restful callouts outside of that transaction. All right, so let's give it a try. So now I'm gonna kick off the restful callouts. It's waiting, but this one, I don't do any wet restful callouts. I click create, oh, and it's fast again. And it's fast. Brilliant, it, it fixed the problem. Now the restful callouts are important because we all know if it's not on Strava, it didn't happen. <laughs> That's right, so um, Nick is definitely gonna have his um, be real and live, but uh, I'm even though it's in the in some tracker, it, it didn't happen. Got it. So I, I love the solution, Anton, but I, I sort of hate the way it looks. Um, it's it's a shame that you have to add an entire process there. It is. I just you know, for a commit. Wouldn't it be great if in the under the execution op options right here, it it could say commit when you're done? That's a great ER. Have you logged it yet? It would look just like that, wouldn't it? It would look like <laughs> 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 so, so we should um uh share this with our audience and have them vote for it. That's right, this is FR1894, as we can see here. So if you're interested in getting a little commit upon success right here, you can uh, go and vote for this uh, random idea. Uh, I suppose not this, while this is a, a, you know an Apex specific kind of thing, we've seen this many times in other production things too, where the transaction scope has to be controlled to be tighter so that you don't lock other sessions, whether it be from Java, Python, Apex, or anywhere. Truly, truly not an Apex specific issue, but it is about understanding your transaction window. When your transaction is done, you should close it. And the way you close it is commit. And oh. that is it for time. All right. So, so that I, was uh, five minutes. So, so um, I will stop sharing screen. Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. So I think that was, um, we, we made it within the time and it's it's a tip that I don't think is absolutely evident. Um, it is not. A lot of people, right, mostly it works fine, but sometimes, and while this was doing a restful call out, the customers I worked with on this exact problem, they had a slow process, a slow SQL statement. They had a lot of data and the query just didn't perform. And it caused the exact same backup across the entire connection pool which unfortunately results in what you guys showed last week's tip, what tip 46 was the 503 error coming out of boards. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, so I'm we will to take additional audience questions, audience. but I wanna tell people that if you came in just for five minutes, this is your chance to, to beat it. Um, we have a, a very small off topic tip, but we're happy to, to take any questions that people might have about, about this um, or comments and keep going. So Hayden, sorry, I interrupted, but. I, I was gonna, um... I say that uh, uh, we're, we're pretty good about um, uh, letting people know once that five minute tip has been achieved, this is that moment, but there will be more discussion as of now. Great. So I, I see um, a comment that says, put your business logic in a stored procedure as an API for an Apex app. And so that's an, that's an interesting topic to me because I actually did an OD tug uh, case code presentation one time about what thick database, smart database, whatever you want to call it, and how you do that with, with Apex. And while I think that's still valid, I also, I have become a convert to let Apex be Apex. Apex does a really great job with automated, automated DML processing, what we just showed here. Um, if, if there's, I don't really see a big reason for, for changing that. Um, a lot of people are going to use automatic DML processing. Um, and even if you have an API for, for something like this, I would argue that your API should not have the commit in it. Um, it so. should not. The, the real reason to push your stuff into PL SQL APIs properly 
is you then get the benefit of running util PL SQL for unit testing. You get the benefit of running a PL SQL debugger, things like that. Those make right. it because then you can test and unit test your stuff outside of, you know, something like Selenium that's going to do UI based testing. Right. Uh, so, so my feeling is if you did have it in, in a stored procedure, you you would actually have a process that would call the stored procedure and then have a commit in it. If the commit is, is pertinent, is the, is the right time to commit your transaction. Um, so, um, so as I say, it's this, uh, the tip we're giving today is, um, a subtle one and that's it's about balance uh, because we're not advocating that people uh, uh, pepper their code with uh, um, tons of commits. Uh, we want them to think very carefully about like what constitutes a transaction. Correct. What one transaction could be the entire page or you might be able to chop it up and there might be three or four discrete transactions that happen and you could sprinkle a commit here and there and lighten some contention. And I see somebody's looking for a link to my idea. Um, I went ahead and put that link in our private chat. I don't know how to get it from the private chat to the other chat. So. We'll put it in the show notes. Oh, okay. It'll go in the show notes. Great. Um, so, oh, and, wow. Somebody, somebody did it. Somebody got it out there. The machine cool. did it. <laughs> so, um, well, great. Well, I don't want to keep people longer than they have to, but I see that there are already a couple of additional uh, instant tips that come just out of this. Uh, Chris, we were talking already about um, things related to UT UTL. Uh, uh, Util HTTP. That's the one. Thank you. Util HTTP. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. So uh, Anton was demoing because he sent me his app and I couldn't get it to run because Util HTTP on my local database was kind of uh, not cooperating, I'll say. So I'm trying to see what we Oracle can do to make things like that easier, along with some other utilities that really we take for granted in other languages that don't exist in PL SQL for whatever reason. Great. So we'll look forward to um, Chris coming back when one of when some of those get worked out. Um, oh, it's going to be. And, a while. <laughs> we actually never never called out that um, Chris is the first external guest who has been a repeat guest. That's Which right. Adds right, a right. lot of pressure. I did have to see if I wore the same shirt last time or not. <laughs> I had I had intended to write the select statement to to figure out just what that where clause was to get it down to one, you know, one row return returned. But I think you're right. It's uh, where guest is not in, you know, an employee of in some and row count number than one greater than one. Something like that. So. <laughs> and uh, which is another way of saying he is our second repeat guest. Yes. yes. Um, so I do have an off topic tip that harkens back to um, my culinary tips. So this is uh, an off topic tip. If you're um, if you're cooking for a crowd, keep in mind that TSP stands for tablespoon and TVSP is um, binary tablespoon. So um, when you're cooking for a crowd, this is how you do the conversion. Nice. That's one. Uh, another great X K K C D. <laughs> Sorry, um, what did you say, Chris? I said that's one big bowl of chili. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and yeah, any closing words, Chris? Uh, the only other thing that actually uh, didn't mention is just this past week, Strava was down. So this, this API, there's another angle there too, which is if you're doing outbound calls, you have to think about the failure cases because uh, things will go down on the far side that you don't control. Of course. Yeah, that's a good a good call. Um, maybe we'll do uh, we'll do a tip on that as well. All, all kinds of tips. The the number of tips just keeps increasing. It just increasing. It never never ends. Um, but yes, uh, but anticipate the possibility of a failure when you build your outbound third party dependencies. Yes. Okay. I guess that's it. It's been people have wasted a perfectly good uh, fourteen minutes. Fourteen minutes. Minute. Um, so we'll let them get back to lunch and all the other things that you might be doing around this time of day. Thanks everyone. Don't forget to Thanks, like and subscribe. Hit the three dots and the splat, um, and all those things. See you next Friday. Bye. -bye.